Not much fun eating alone. Not much fun spending the day alone. Where is everybody? What are friends for, anyway? The natural world can be a cold and lonely place. Filled with predators of all shapes and sizes, it can be difficult to go it alone. And so some species have learned that it takes two to make a thing go right. When it's so much fun to have a friend and be a friend, why is it some people are not friends? Here's Jane, she's a friend. Carl is not a friend. Wouldn't it be more fun to have more friends? You'd rather stay here alone. Oh, I won't be alone. I've got my friends. Dick. Good old Dick. Mutualism. When two unrelated species team up for the greater good. We all have fun with our own friends. But what about other people? Mightn't they be fun? After all, we're all strangers till we make friends. Hi, I'm Danielle Defoe, and you're watching Animal Logic Second Nature. Mutualism is a type of symbiotic relationship in which two species bring something different to the table, and they both benefit. One very common form of mutualism is a service resource relationship. This is when one species gets a service and the other gets food. Red billed oxpeckers are probably the most famous example of this. They eat the ectoparasites off of large ungulates like rhinos and warn their partners of danger by flying away. They primarily rid their clients of ticks and botfly larvae. Using their specialized flat bills, they can comb out and eat up to 100 fully engorged ticks or over 10,000 larvae in a single day. Sometimes, if their host has an open wound, they will peck at it, drinking their highly nutritious blood. This doesn't last long, as their clients will quickly get annoyed, and the oxpecker will go back to eating parasites. Because of this, there is a bit of controversy over whether they're cleaners or just vampiric parasites. One study found that if you remove the birds, the tick load remains almost the same, but their wounds heal faster. For oxpeckers, the ticks might just be a happy coincidence in their vampiric feeding strategy. And even then, they only eat fully engorged ticks, which does nothing to help stop the spread of disease in the supposed clients. Phagophilia, eating parasites off of a host, is also quite common at sea. Well, Paul, uh, how would you like a trip down to the bottom of the sea without even getting your feet wet? Several genera of gobies feed off of the ectoparasites of sharks, rays, turtles, and many other large marine mammals. However, wrasses are the most common cleaner fish, and they're really good at it. A single wrasse can inspect 2,200 animals a day and remove about half of their parasites, usually isopods. One of the potentially coolest instances of phagophilia is also one of the least documented. There's a story from ancient Greek historian Herodotus of crocodiles who keep their mouths open for Egyptian plovers to come in and clean their teeth. But despite thousands of years of observation, there are no confirmed cases or photographic evidence. But even better than service resource mutualism is service service mutualism. These are nature's best team ups. In service-service mutualistic relationships, two animals provide services for each other in exchange for the benefits of those services. The clownfish and sea anemone relationship is the poster child of this. An unwary fish has brushed against the tentacles. Anemones have stingers on their tentacles, which are too painful for most fish to tolerate, with two main exceptions, clownfish and butterfly fish. Butterfly fish predate upon anemones, and so the anemones employ clownfish as bodyguards. The clownfish lives in the anemone, immune to its poison, protecting it from butterfly fish, while the sea anemone protects the clownfish from other predators. 
At night, the movements of the clownfish keep up the water flow rate to get new oxygenated water to the anemone. Without the clownfish, the anemone would have to retract at the slightest hint of danger, costing them feeding opportunities. Also, the anemone seems to use the ammonia secreted by the clownfish as a fertilizer, so there is also a service resource component to this relationship. Of all the team-ups in nature, this one is the most surprising. Some spiders will team up with small frogs and live in the same burrow. This is particularly unusual because large spiders usually eat small frogs. But these spiders and frogs have come to a mutually beneficial agreement. The spider protects the burrow from predators like snakes. In exchange, the frog protects the spider's eggs from egg-eating insects. As a bonus, the frog gets to eat the insects attracted by the spider's leftovers. The frogs are bodyguards for the spider's kids. Similarly, gopis and pistol shrimp have learned to team up to keep a safe home. Pistol or snapping shrimp, while more known for their explosive arms, are fantastic burrowers, but they have fairly poor eyesight. Gobies, on the other hand, have much better vision and pressure detection, but aren't particularly good at making burrows. And so, the two team up. While the shrimp makes and maintains the burrow, the goby plays sentinel. If the predator approaches, the fish dives into the burrow and the shrimp follows, always keeping one antenna touching the goby so it can guide the shrimp to safety. One thing they may be running from is another mutualistic relationship. But these fish don't team up for defense. They team up to hunt. Well, schnoz or no schnoz, no darn fish that ever swamp can get the best of me. Whoopee! Moray eels and groupers are polar opposites. Groupers are diurnal and hunt in open water, while morays are nocturnal and hunt in tight coral reefs and rock crevices. But as they say, opposites team up to kill dumb fish. Hunting alone, both morays and groupers have a strong chance of losing their prey, either to the open water in the case of morays, or to the reef for the bulky groupers. And so, these fish team up to cover both routes of escape, drastically increasing their chances of a successful hunt. To start the hunt, a grouper will find a moray and signal it by shaking its head. Usually, the grouper will lead the moray to a reef where there's prey hiding, and the moray will flush it out of cover. If the prey tries to escape the reef, the grouper eats it. If it hesitates and stays in the reef, the moray eats it. The two partners in crime don't share the loot, but it does increase the long-term hunting success for both of them. Likewise, coyotes and badgers team up to execute a similar strategy on land. Individually, they have different strategies. The badger is a great digger, but a poor runner, while the coyote is a great chaser in open spaces, but isn't a great digger. And so, when hunting alone, their chances of catching fleet-footed burrowers like ground rodents is small. But when they hunt together, the rodent doesn't stand a chance. They either flee underground and get dug out by the badger, or they try to outrun the badger, only to be ambushed or chased down by the coyote. Like with mores and groupers, they don't share food once caught, but both their chances of catching a meal increase enough in the long run to make it worth it. So what should I talk about next? Please let me know in the comments and be sure to subscribe for new episodes of Animal Logic Second Nature every other week. Thanks for watching!